Diet sodas and sugar-free drinks. Since there's no sugar in them, they're perfectly fine to drink, right? No! What? Wait a minute. You mean to tell me I can't drink these either? These aren't healthy? But isn't it healthier than sugar? Welcome to another video, guys. Dr. Mike Hansen here, and let's discuss diet sweeteners, aka sugar substitutes. The truth is, I used to drink these all the time in med school and beyond for years. Now, before I started drinking these in 2004, I looked like this. And I thought drinking sugar-free Red Bulls were no big deal, like, eh, whatever. But as I would pound these down over time, I noticed something. I was getting hungrier and hungrier and my cravings just got worse and worse, just eating like crazy. I mean, these drinks weren't the only reason. I was stressed out from working crazy hours in my doctor training, I wasn't exercising as much, not sleeping great, and I was eating food that I shouldn't have been eating, including sugar. But the bottom line was the cravings were up and I was putting on weight. The dad bod without being a daddy. That Hansel's so hot right now. It wasn't until recently I ditched these drinks and recently I was starting to dig through the research on diet sweeteners and how they impact your health. Now this is what I've learned. Sugar substitutes are categorized as nutritive and non-nutritive sweeteners. Nutritive sweeteners, those include xylitol and sorbitol, which can be used to prevent tooth decay and cavities. They generally have the same number of calories as sugar, so there's no caloric restriction benefit there. Non-nutritive sweeteners are either artificially created or they're derived from plants. Now, examples include saccharin, aspartame, sucralose, ACE-K, monk fruit extract, and stevia. Now, Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, they use aspartame, which is also known as NutraSweet. Coke Zero, Pepsi Zero, and Sugar-Free Red Bull. They use aspartame and ACE-K, which is acesulfame potassium. A Red Bull Zero just takes sugar-free Red Bull and adds a third sweetener, sucralose, which is also known as Splenda. These non-nutritive sweeteners have few to no calories and have a higher intensity sweetness when compared to regular sugar, so they're dosed in smaller amounts. Also, they don't have the same kind of sweetness as sugar. A lot of people notice that there's a bitter aftertaste. Also, some of them aren't suitable at high temperatures like when you use it for baking because the chemical structure becomes deformed. But are non-nutritive sweeteners, are they healthy? In the United States, there's been a transition from sugary drink to sugar-free drinks because of the obesity epidemic. Almost half of Coca-Cola sales in the US were sugar-free. So with all that reduction in sugar, did that result in many people losing weight? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it. The effects of substituting diet sweeteners for sugar has been looked at in several studies and the evidence shows that they're correlated with metabolic syndrome. Now, as of right now, that's been not been proven to be the case that they cause metabolic syndrome, but there is correlation there. So it very well could be that they're causing it, but it just hasn't been proven yet. But it also could be that people with metabolic syndrome are consuming more and more of these artificially sweetened drinks. And what it really boils down to is does consuming these diet drinks result in reduced caloric intake and subsequent improvements in body fat and improvement in their metabolic health? Now, as of right now, we don't know what these artificial sweeteners do to your long-term food intake, your body fat or metabolic status, meaning insulin resistance. So far, there haven't been any long-term studies that have proved anything, but I'm very skeptical that they by themselves improve people's metabolic health. Now, let's think about this for a second. Let's say you drink a Diet Pepsi or a Pepsi Zero. Your tongue senses that sweetness from the artificial sweetener. The taste buds, they send a signal to the brain, specifically the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is tricked into thinking that this is real sugar because it tastes sweet. So it then sends a message by way of the vagus nerve to the pancreas, telling it to get ready to metabolize the sugar that's about to come your way. So the pancreas is revving up, starting to secrete insulin, but the sugar never comes, unless of course you're consuming real sugar in addition to the artificial sweetener. Like for example, if you eat french fries with ketchup in addition to that Diet Coke. But let's say you're strictly drinking diet soda. What happens next? The pancreas was fooled into thinking that it needs to secrete insulin. Does the pancreas say, oh, no worries, I'll just save this insulin for next time. I'll just release it later on. Nope. The pancreas sends a signal to the brain to stimulate appetite, so you eat more. So that insulin it already made can be put to use. Now check out this study, which entailed four groups of people. They all ate a normal diet for six months, but the group was divided into four smaller groups. One group drank a liter of sugar to soda per day, 
Another group drink a liter of diet soda per day. The third group drink a liter of milk per day. And the last group drink a liter of water per day. Now, as expected, the group that drink sugared soda gained weight, 22 pounds. Now, what about the diet soda group? They gained three and a half pounds. The milk group stayed the same. And the water group lost four and a half pounds. While gaining three and a half pounds in the diet drink group is much better compared to the 22 pounds gained in the sugar group, they still gained weight despite eating the same amount of calories. And the milk has as many calories as the sugared soda. So why didn't they gain weight? It's because the fat and lactose in milk did not trigger the same kind of insulin response as the artificial sweetener. Now, how about this study that converted diet soda drinkers to water drinkers? They end up losing six pounds. Water and diet sweeteners have the same amount of calories, zero. So why did the water drinkers lose six pounds? It's because of different insulin responses. Now check out this study that looked at 17 morbidly obese adults who did not have diabetes. The researchers specifically looked at insulin response to carbonated beverages. So they compared insulin responses between diet sodas and seltzer, which does not have an artificial sweetener. The insulin response to the diet soda was 20% higher compared to the seltzer. Now, there are some other reasons why artificial sweeteners are generally unhealthy. For example, diet soda, it doesn't have fiber. And generally speaking, more diet soda consumption leads to less fiber consumption, especially when it comes to the insoluble fiber. This likely leads to changes in the gut microbiome and not for the better. In this scenario, the bad bacteria, they claim more and more of the gut territory, eventually eroding the mucin layer of the lining of the gut, causing microscopic little leaks there, allowing pro-inflammatory chemicals to seep into the bloodstream, which promotes metabolic syndrome and fat deposition. In addition to that, the intestinal bacteria influences what the brain senses, including the sensation of feeling hungry or feeling full. Some studies suggest that certain diet sweeteners may have insulin-like properties of their own, contributing to fat deposition. Also, some people might actually become addicted to artificial sweeteners, but it's too soon to know if that's the case or not. Now, this is based on some animal studies that suggest similar brain pathways between real sugar and artificial sweeteners. Aspartame was well studied in animal models and it had profound negative effects on oxidative stress and inflammation. These health concerns were ignored by the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. They turned a blind eye to all 73 studies that showed the harmful effects of aspartame while accepting 84% of the studies that showed no harm. Then there was this, a study looking at the association with cancer. Specifically, they looked at over 100,000 people in France who consumed artificial sweeteners, and they accounted for other variables, such as age, smoking status, and more. They then compared that group to those who didn't consume artificial sweeteners. The verdict? In this large cohort study, artificial sweeteners, especially aspartame and ACE-K, were associated with an increased cancer risk, about a 13% increased risk. So there's association, but it didn't prove that they cause it. Now, when doing a nutritional study, they're usually done with people recalling what they consumed, but people forget especially about things that they think aren't good for them. There's a lot of nutritional studies out there that can conclude nothing more than correlation or association and rarely causation. Now, in order to determine causation in research, you need one of two kinds of studies. One is a randomized control trial, which is the gold standard for drug or vaccine evaluation. But then nutritional studies are notoriously hard to control for because when doing a prospective study, meaning you do an intervention and then you see what happens, it's hard to alter people's diets for any length of time, especially more than two months. So what is the other kind of nutritional study that can prove causation? What's well, called an econometric analysis. That's how it's proven that smoking tobacco caused lung cancer. It's also how sugar was proven to cause type 2 diabetes. These studies analyze changes in disease rates over time, taking into account coexisting variables, and then using statistical analyses to draw conclusions. These studies, in addition to randomized controlled trials, they're complex though. So part of the way that you overcome that problem is by having large numbers in multiple studies. Overall, drinking artificial sweeteners is probably much better than drinking sugared soda, but still much worse compared to drinking water, especially when it comes to insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity. 
So while the studies we have so far don't prove causation of either metabolic syndrome or cancer, it's definitely hard to ignore the correlations, especially because obesity and metabolic syndrome continue to be so prevalent despite an overall decrease in sugar consumption. The bottom line, it's best to drink water. And if you need your caffeine fix with coffee or tea, then ditch the sugar substitutes.